Parker. Can you grab her? Can you grab her JP Mark? Mark. Heidegger thought the. Hold on for a second, Mark. What's up? I just. I wasn't completely framed. They're still doing headphones. Marker? Mark? <laughs> okay, what did Heidegger, Heidegger say? Heidegger thought the, the deepest history of being, the, the deepest history that we talked about, um, had all these different worlds in it. But what all, all the Western world shared was something Heidegger thought very important, very central. That was uh, an urge for what he called planning, um, f uh, the ability to anticipate what we would encounter in any given situation and be ready to deal with it and, and engage with it. And, and each of these worlds had a different way of planning and, and making the world a tamer place and a safer place for us. So whether it was the Christians knowing God's will and knowing how history would unfold through the Bible, or whether it was the moderns having figured out how everything worked and how to calculate things so that they, we could impose our will on the universe. Uh, he thought that all of us were engaged in this form of planning. Could you, I, I loved what you said last night about how that was necessary. Yeah. There was a you said you said that 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 at, at first everything could they could just in ancient Greek that they were happy with letting everything whoosh up and then for some reason I don't remember why you said that just wasn't okay anymore. Yeah, because sure. Maybe you could say that. that yeah. Um, uh, uh, is he? He's yeah, going to yeah, stay there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, this this you can understand why this drive for planning would be desirable if you contrast it with uh, the, the pre-philosophical, the very ancient Greek world that we get access to through the writings of Homer. Um, uh, the, the Greek ideal, there were a few Greek ideal human beings, ideal men, but one of them was the hero, and Odysseus was their paradigmatic hero. And we're told in the very introduction to the Odyssey that he was a man of many ways which meant that Odysseus was ready for whatever popped up and appeared and whatever new thing he confronted. So a new monster would appear and Odysseus would figure out how to change and adapt and be ready for that. Or a god would appear and make a demand on Odysseus and he would be ready to, to deal with that situation. And, and this, this sort of world where you never knew what was going to happen to you, you never knew what was going to pop up, was an ideal world to become a hero. Or to show yourself as an, a heroic individual, as someone who could, who, who could face whatever challenge came up and, and, and engage with it and conquer it. But you can imagine that if you're not very heroic, how terrifying such a world would be. You wouldn't know what was going to come next, and you wouldn't know what was going to happen, and, and it could be a, a terrible disaster, and, and you would really suffer. And so we got, as a culture, speaking very broadly now in, in terms of millennia, as a culture, we got addicted to this desire for uh, stability and uh, being able to know what to expect and making the world a reliable place. And now, at this point in our history, we have these twin urges. And, and they, they're, they're not always consistent with each other, but I think it really characterizes our culture. One is an urge for efficiency. We, we ha whatever we want, we want to be able to achieve it as efficiently as possible. The other is an urge for flexibility. We don't want to be tied down. We want to uh, be able to dabble in all sorts of things, enjoy all sorts of different possibilities. Um, and those are great. Uh, efficiency is a wonderful thing, and, and flexibility is a wonderful thing. But it's important to notice that efficiency and flexibility and the drive for efficiency and flexibility threaten the sort of very meaningful practices and the very meaningful ways of focusing our lives and giving, giving importance to our lives that uh, skillful mastery of cooking or music or sports or um, that, that, that of uh, skills, artisanship, craftsmanship that those represent. Um, St the standardization that's required for efficiency uh, rules out those sorts of practices. And, and, and what characterizes all of them is that they're not terribly efficient. Uh, they, 
um, require a real sensitivity and receptivity to what the particular world requires and what particular things you're encountering in your local community and the sort of people who live there. And, and what all of these masters had was a great sensitivity for the concrete details of the situation they found themselves in. That's not efficient. It's much more efficient to just standardize things, make everybody's expectations the same, make the commodities you provide to satisfy the, the expectations the same, and, and uh, produce them in mass and ship them. And, and so you, the most efficient world is a world where everything in the world works the same way. And, and we can produce uh, our goods wherever it's most economical to produce them, ship them as efficiently to anywhere else in the world, and have people already there prepared to deal with the kind of food or, or tools or clothes or whatever it is that, that we ship to them. So, uh, so this, this drive for efficiency interferes with it. All of these practices of, of, of mastery, of craftsmanship, are terribly unflexible. It requires commitment and dedication and uh, it takes a long time to acquire the skills and to, to attune your body to the world that shows up for uh, uh, any sort of craftsman. And so um, again, to the degree that we want flexibility in our lives, it uh, makes those kinds of very deep, meaningful world, local world specific practices, it, it makes them um, obstacles um, to living uh, these worlds of continual reinvention and rediscovery and, and flexibility. So th the way that we're dealing with that in technology is to turn all the good things that came from these kinds of skillful practices into commodities which can be efficiently and flexibly provided upon demand. So that if, uh, if we get a hankering for whatever reason for Cajun food, we can produce it wherever we are as quickly and efficiently as possible. And technology is very, very good at producing something like what each of these deeply skillful, meaningful practices is able to do. We have technologies for the production of music. We have technologies for the production of food. And for the listening to music. And, and for the listening to music. And, and we get, um, and it's true that it changes us. So we have to become the kind of people who are satisfied with the sort of commodities that are delivered to us. So you can imagine that, you could imagine people who really are connoisseurs of jazz music who, and really understand that one of the great things about jazz music is the way the mu musicians are responding to the performance hall and the audience and the particular musicians that are there and, and, and the weather and, and whatever accidents are happening. Uh, the jazz musicians are, are incorporating it into their performance. And if you as a listener are a skillful listener and have the, the bodily dispositions to pick up on that, you'd never be satisfied by listening to a recorded jazz performance on CD because that's not the performance that would be optimal for your bedroom or, or living room or whatever. But technology makes us also the sort of flexible people who uh, are satisfied with a sort of cheap imitation of all the goods that, that uh, deeply skillful practices deliver. You might want to add that the, the flamenco artists, uh, for this reason, uh, 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 hate being recorded because they hate the idea of somebody listening to them out of context. You, you know? want me to say this? Sure. Uh, no uh, well, uh, okay. It's true. <laughs> uh, should I just say it, or yeah. I mean, yeah, if, just, if, uh, if you I don't know. Like authentic doing it, or you say I've heard. You can say I've heard that that, that the flamenco artists uh, uh, are have a, a natural aversion to even being recorded because they just hate to be listened to out of context. So they realize that that's taking away so much of what it is to listen to this music and be a part of it. Okay. I just I, I thought it, it goes so well these two examples. Okay. You know? All right. Um, I've heard that flamenco artists have a deep aversion to even being recorded for this very reason that they they have just an intuitive sense that recording them and making their performance reproducible 
in all sorts of foreign contexts is, is uh, distorting what flamenco is really all about. And, uh, and so, okay, so, so, so in this film we're trying to kind of encourage people to nurture their skills and the practices that still survive before they're all swallowed up by this. Uh, I know we each, uh, each of the philosophers we're talking to has their own take a little bit on whether it is possible to, or is, is this just a dying nostalgic thing? Or uh, I'd love for you to talk about your vision for if, if there's a way to, to, to keep this alive. And obviously the first step is making people aware of, of this, maybe. Mm -hmm. But not in a way that, uh, that just makes it accessible to everybody. But uh, uh, there is this notion of these vocal practices and that they're, they're dying away, or maybe new ones are coming up. And, and, and what do you think it is about them that we have to find in ourselves? And, 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 and what is it about this receptivity that we should try and nurture? And can we preserve a sense of the sacred in our lives? That's okay. the, big, the big, big question. Yeah. Uh, when I talk about these sorts of things, I'm often accused of a kind of nostalgia. A lot of, in our hyper-modern technological world, um, when you start talking about these sort of old-fashioned practices and so on, it seems like you're just, you're wishing for a world that, that doesn't exist anymore. You're ignoring all the great things that come with technology. And, and I don't mean to do that, but I think there is something very important that's lost, and I think we all have access to a sense for this. Uh, if, if you've had a really fantastic meal, um, in that moment you couldn't imagine eating at McDonald's. Right? You recognize immediately the difference between the sort of standardized efficient meal that McDonald's is very, very good at producing and the, the, the rich subtle meal that's tailored to you and the specific situation that and, you're and in. Can you say, and, and your community, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the earth that gives these ingredients, and flush that out, and flush that out a little bit. Uh, right yeah, uh, yeah. so, so what, what skillful practices like this do are um, produce a kind of connection to a very local situation to the kind of human beings and the kind of human lives that inhabit a particular community, to the, the weather and the seasons of that community, to uh, even the geography and the climate. Um, uh, uh, meals, I think, are a great example. A, a meal prepared using local foods um, is very, very sensitive to the place that you live in. And, um, and so when you participate in, in deeply skillful practices, which have been honed always in a particular place and with reference to other particular people and, uh, and in a way that's tailored to a specific world, you are introduced into a sense of belonging somewhere. And you're, you're exposed to things which really, really matter. It really, really matters to uh, your... Moses! Participating in these sorts of skillful, skillful practices introduce you to things that really matter, that can't be easily replaced, because they belong in, they hold a unique place in a world. Uh, so uh, uh, a practice of carpentry that's grown up with a, a specific set of people and the way they live their lives and the sort of furniture that they need and the sort of spaces they need to carry out their practices for living, a, a piece of furniture that's tailored to that and reflects um, the sense of beauty that you get from the environment you live in. That piece of furniture acquires a depth of meaning that uh, some mass-produced, standardized piece of furniture can never approximate because without that table or chair, um, having exactly the form that it does and being tailored in exactly the way it is to, to life's practices, they wouldn't operate the same way. They wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to, to live your life in the way that you can by having that table. 
and so the practice of carpentry becomes not just a means for producing commodities for living. It becomes a way of focusing what lives in our community are all about. And, and, and so do you think that, that, that we have an ability in, this, in our world without neglecting technology to, uh, to keep those practices alive or maybe even make new ones that, that, that make us responsive to the local environment or is it yeah, the other reason I don't think this is nostalgic is I don't think it's I don't think living life in this way is something that's over. I think there are still possibilities for us to 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 get um, connected to the world. Sorry. Yeah. Joe, how about the kill that sun that's coming on his chest now? I think uh, down on the stand or you're really on. And it's after our break. Yeah. I'm loving. All I this needed the powerful. break. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ah. Uh. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. You're right. You say that and Tao can cut it in and Just, yeah, yeah, exactly. You can describe the, the, the uh, yeah, because this is the last, uh, this is the last minute of just what you were saying, and then we're done. So okay. I just think I, I think it's important. To, I I really like what you're saying because I don't think that it's, uh, uh, that it's something just of the past. I think you're right. I think that, and I think we see it around us. We see people who are local. We see a local food movement. We see people who like are respecting crafts, and I think that if, if we can uh, encourage. A sensitivity to the importance of that. Yeah. I think that's that's that's, that's good. <laughs> you ready, Gala? Yeah, I can say one more thing. Maybe yeah. you work in and I kept thinking the, the meal off the table made by Hiroshi was well, not like the meal off the table Well yeah, he said that pretty much right he now. He didn't say about Hiroshi, but he said yeah. Right. Uh, I, I I can certainly cut <laughs> Manuel saying his thing about the table right. after what he's already said. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the other reason that uh, um an appreciation for these sort of skillful practices isn't nostalgic is I don't think that that's a possibility that's closed off to us anymore. I think that we can um, bring back the centrality of these kind of practices to our lives even still today and even using technological devices as a means of doing it. What's important is that we find practices which will connect us to the world in a specific way, not a, not a generic way, and that we do it in a uh, we connect to the world uh, in a committed way, so that we have time to develop a taste and to develop a receptivity and develop dispositions, which let us uh, engage with the world in the richer way that that these possibilities provide for us. Onto something. Okay, shh, let me say it. Okay, so, so here we come back to this very important idea of Heidegger's, that we are not just thinking beings. We are beings who are uh, skillfully engaged with the world and disclose worlds through our skillful engagement. And what, what we need to do is find a kind of receptivity which is sensitive to those features of the world which are specific to us and defining for us and, and, and become sensitive to, uh, to look around and see where we are in the world, become sensitive to the communities we live in, to the kind of people who are here, to the kind of uh, things that are made available to us where we live that aren't just generically available anywhere in the world. And if we could start fostering a receptivity to them, getting in tune with them, and getting our bodies adjusted to 
the world that we find ourselves in, um, we'll begin to acquire once again a taste for uh, these skillful goods, skillful practices. Ah, fluent. You, well, no, you say that, yeah. Let's get you in the same thing. Yeah. Cut. Great job, Mark.